Hello, everyone. Thank you for connecting. Let's pray and get started with uh, today's session. Abba Father, we thank you for your grace in our lives. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for uh, the, the powerful truth that we're learning from the book of Acts and the kind of impact, Lord, that cities experience by your people. Uh, and Father God, even as we uh, learn, we pray, God, that we too will be uh, carriers of your glory, Lord, to the places and communities where you place us. We worship you. We honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today we will look at Acts 19 and 20. Uh, in Acts 19, Paul is already in his third missionary journey and he has reached Ephesus. We saw how he ministers to believers who do not know about the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, you know, they are, they are then, they receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We also saw how God worked unusual miracles through Paul's handkerchiefs, where the anointing was able to heal and deliver people. We saw how Paul and his team exercised authority, and uh, uh, why, when others tried to only use the principles, it did not work for them. Now, because of such a powerful demonstration of the power of God, uh, we'll see you know, how the city is impacted. But before that, let's quickly talk a little bit about the city of Ephesus. It's, uh, it, it was a great metropolis of its times with 225,000 people. Uh, and the prominent play, place or uh, uh, the prominent temple in Ephesus was that of Artemis, a Greek goddess, also known as Diana. She was known as the goddess of um, fertility. And uh, there were many who worshipped the goddess Diana. So now with this information, you know, let's uh, go ahead and we will continue in Acts chapter 19. So as um, the power of God was demonstrated through the life of Apostle Paul, uh, and especially, you know, when the seven sons of Sceva were overpowered by demon spirits and people noticed the kind of authority that came with faith in the Lord Jesus, there were many uh, practitioners of magic who, who gave up their magic and in fact, they burnt all their articles. The uh, amount of uh, money that the articles uh, would have costed was 50,000 pieces of silver, which is apparently a huge value of money in those times. Uh, but people were willing to burn it all up because they, they saw the power that Paul carried and the power of God, you know, that he was demonstrating. Now, when uh, such things happened, uh, they was quite a lot of unrest in Ephesus. There were people who uh, believed, people who used to follow Dinah, the goddess who stopped following Dinah. And so uh, what happened is there was a man by the name of Demetrius who was selling um, silver shrines of Dinah, uh, but he, his business was affected as a craftsman. He had a loss. And, and so he took up this matter and uh, there was a great uproar. It began with Demetrius, but then there was like this great uproar, which could not be, uh, could, could not be um, solved. And, and so, you know, people joined together and made a huge noise about uh, how, how, Ephesus belonged to Dinah and uh, um, the worshippers of Dinah. So, uh, in in a case where people are, there's like a mob coming together and there is unrest. Uh, the officials were afraid that uh, you know that their 
their power would be taken away from them and so they had to quickly uh, bring back things to order uh, and so they tried they tried in fact uh, uh, we read about a couple of people who actually step in as a man uh, called alexander who tries to come before the multitude and um, bring in some peace and uh, and quiet but people are not willing to listen to him because he was a jew and later on you know we we find that uh, uh, another person uh, steps in here and uh, he sort of manages the whole situation and he says that you know they they are already they were already known uh, for the goddess Dinah and so that they shouldn't worry uh, about co someone coming and taking away uh, the name that uh, Dinah had at at that uh, time and so this is how you know somehow they just bring rest uh, to the city but the point for us to note is that the ministry of paul with the demonstration of the holy spirit had an impact definitely had an impact and it had a huge impact uh, it seemed to have affected uh, this craftsman and it may have affected other craftsmen it definitely affected those who, who were engaged in occultic practices so it affected religion you could put it that way it, it affected trade uh, it it affected you know everything uh, in the in the city so uh, there was this this new awakening to the fact that uh, the god that Paul was preaching and the power of that God that was being released through Paul's life was very, very real. Uh, and so people responded to that. Uh, and, you know, uh, again, the, there was a commotion because of the accusation against Paul, but things were brought to uh, arrest. So this is how things went in uh, Ephesus. And the way we saw in Corinth, uh, Paul struggled, he faced uh, opposition, he faced persecution, and very similar things take place in uh, Ephesus as well. So things were not easy for Paul. But another very significant thing that happened in uh, Ephesus for us to note is the time when Paul was actually able to minister to people. So what Paul did is he tried preaching in the synagogues. Uh, however, he wasn't accepted in the synagogue. So before all this uproar took place, he managed to find a school called as the School of Tyrannus, where uh, he taught the word of God. So tracking back a little bit to verses uh, 9 and 10 here, it says, but when some were hardened and did not believe but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So he taught there for two years, and as the scripture states, there was a powerful impact the people who learned in the school of Tyrannus they went back to their own places so we see there Asia heard the word of the Lord so both the Jewish communities and the Greek communities in Asia were powerfully ministered to so another aspect for us to note here is that though Paul could not personally go to all of these places to preach the gospel People who were trained by him, people into whom he poured out uh, knowledge and he imparted, uh, you know, the gifts of God, we see that they were the ones who finally went and ministered in all of these places and God did something amazing. So even today, when we are equipping people uh, and when they are sent out, we can expect God to work mightily uh, through through them in their own places and regions. So the efforts of Paul uh, were definitely useful and fruitful. And uh, let's now briefly take a look at the map for us to once again 
look at Paul's third missionary journey so that you know we are able to grasp the new places where Paul is going to go and uh, minister in. Okay, I'm just sharing the screen. I hope uh, you are able to see here. We are at Ephesus. And uh, from here, the journey is going to continue into the Macedonian region. So uh, Paul will spend some time here. He will also stop by at Corinth. That would be his second uh, time in Corinth. Uh, and then again, you know, he will come back through the Macedonian region and he will come to this place known as Troas. So uh, we'll go ahead and you know, we'll learn more about this in Acts chapter 20. Uh, in Acts chapter 20, we also see that he goes to other port regions that are shown on the map here, Assos. Uh, and uh, uh, Mytilene, Chios, Samos, and then finally he will come to this place called as Miletus, where he will address the elders from the church of Ephesus. So this is how the journey continues. So in Acts 19, it's mostly about him being here in Ephesus, training up the uh, people who came to study with him uh, in the school of Tyrannus. And, and then, of course, you know, they go back and they make an impact in Asia over the Jewish and the Greek communities. And we also saw how the demonstration of God's power. So while Paul uh, definitely taught the word of God, we also see that he demonstrated the power of God. So both of these went hand in hand and there was a great impact on the people and many people turned to the Lord. Uh, we'll see in Acts 20 that he'll call the elders of the church to speak to them. Uh, but at the same time, you know, when we consider the fact that there were elders of the church, uh, it's so clear that there was a church built up, established, and that's why you know, uh, there are elders of the church and uh, Paul is even able to speak to them. So definitely the work done here was notable. Let's now move on. We'll uh, go on to Acts chapter 20. We've seen in the map how um, you know Paul will go to the Macedonian region. So that's the direction that uh, Paul takes in Acts 20. So after leaving Ephesus, he goes back to the places that he had visited during the second missionary journey. And uh, he spent some time there. <laughs> Excuse me. The reason why uh, Paul revisits the places where churches were established earlier is to simply strengthen the disciples, to further equip them in the word of God. Uh, and we can also say that he would have appointed elders and leaders in the church. Now, this gives us a picture of the emerging or the evolving church government Initially, in the early chapters of uh, the book of Acts, it was only the apostles. Uh, and then, you know, we have the uh, volunteers uh, whom we see in Acts chapter 6. And eventually, by the time we come to Acts 15, we see others involved, the council. And now it seems to be a norm in the new churches that were planted during the missionary journey, where there are elders uh, in the church, there are um, uh, you know several co-workers, uh, and so you know we're gonna we're gonna see this happening, and uh, or, or being very obvious in Acts chapter twenty. So he goes to the Macedonian region for the sake you know, to strengthen the churches and uh, equip them further. Now, while talking about the 
a travel of Apostle Paul, there's also a mention of very many uh, teammates of Paul. So we see their names here in Acts 20. Uh, from verse 4, we can read about, you know, Sopater of uh, Beria. Uh, we can read about Aristarchus, Secondus of the Thessalonians, Gaius of uh, uh, Derby, Timothy from Lystra, uh, Tychicus, and uh, Trophimus. So there are travel companions of Paul, and this helps us recognize that uh, we need not do ministry all alone. God has placed graces and gifts on people's lives, and he makes the divine connection for people to come together and uh, serve him well and make a greater impact as you know, uh, uh, we are all serving together. So this is the example that Paul has given us, one of team ministry. Uh, another thing to note uh, in in this passage is there are names of people from various places, and uh, um, uh, safe to say, and I think I've mentioned it earlier, that people from different strata of society where serving the Lord together. From, Thessalon from Thessalonica, we have names of Aristarchus, which uh, which indicates that this person was probably from a well-to-do family. At the same time, there is a name Secondus, which indicates that this person was uh, probably from, uh, you know, like he had a background in slavery or his, his uh, ancestors had such a background but the beautiful thing is in the sight of god you know all uh, people are uh, made in his image and so there is there is no such hierarchy uh, and they were they are all children of god serving the lord together and it's really wonderful to see how everyone was uh, together serving the lord and this is how uh, paul carried on with his missionary journey so he comes to uh, Macedonia, and uh, uh, it was in Macedonia that he writes Second Corinthians. Now he wrote First Corinthians when he was in Ephesus, and uh, Second Corinthians is written when he is in Macedonia. So this is another point for us to note. Now let's move on. We've seen how he ministers in this place, and then he. Uh, he comes to other places. So when he comes to Corinth, it's uh, in that place that uh, he is known to have written the letter to the Romans. So um, we can make a note of that. So in Corinth, he writes to the Romans, and then he continues his journey. So from Philippi, he now moves on to this place called as Troas. Troas, um, he's accompanied by uh, those seven brothers whose names we already mentioned, and uh, uh, we'll see what happens in the city of Troas. So when he comes to Troas, uh, Paul takes time to minister to the believers we read about the believers gathering on the first day of the week. So it is likely that by now there was a practice of meeting on a particular day of the week um, for worship. And we also see in verse 7 that they broke bread. Uh, and, you know, they, they wanted to hear the word of God. So there was this practice of coming together, worshipping, breaking bread and... Uh, excuse me, spending time in the word of God. So that is probably where, you know, we get our, our uh, uh, practice of worshiping the Lord on one given day of the week. Now, apart from this, we notice that the believers had gathered in the upper room and it was in the evening when Paul was speaking to them. And uh, Paul spoke till midnight, he says. So why did the people gather in the evening? Some commentators say that uh, the people used to work, and which is why they 
gathered in the evening after work uh, and they heard the word of god but it's really wonderful to note that uh, even though they were tired they still made time to hear god's word and they carry that kind of zeal and passion for the word of god and paul was ministering to such people mm, however there's the mention of a man by the name of eutychus uh, so something unusual happened and that is uh, when eutychus was listening to the preaching of paul he he fell asleep and he fell off the third floor uh, now it, we can only imagine whether paul was offended by this or not you know because somebody slept when apostle paul you know of all people was teaching god's word uh, but anyway it happened he fell and uh, uh, he was taken up dead is what the verse says that means that he died but even in such a situation in such a really um, uh, challenging situation god's power is demonstrated paul goes down he uh, he picks up uh, he um, uh, i'll just read the exact uh, scripture here verse 10 of acts 20 but paul went down fell on him and embracing him said do not trouble yourselves for his life is in him so he is resurrected from the dead and he is brought back into the service that is going on uh, late in the evening and amazing how paul continues to uh, speak the word of god and minister to these people until daybreak so he went on preaching it seems like um, you know even a man dying did not disturb apostle paul and uh, he by faith was able to minister to that dead man the man was raised from the dead and you know they're back to their meeting they're back to the the ministry of the word so Uh, so very inspiring for us today to note how um, people gathered and you know ministers of god uh, were serving the people so he after uh, through us you know he continued to miletus as we saw on the map there were some stops that he would have made uh, at the ports and uh, he moves on he goes finally up to this place called as miletus and in this place he asks for the elders of the ephesian church to meet him so maybe it was this wise decision of not going back into uh ephesus where trouble awaited paul so he is being safe he's being wise sorry and uh, uh he is now planning to speak to the elders so when the uh, ephesian elders come he spends some time with them and he speaks on certain matters so what are the highlights of uh, paul's speech to the ephesian elders he brings their attention to the kind of ministry uh, that he did among them so he talks about how he served the lord with all humility which was obvious or which was visible to the people and he also talks about um how he um with many tears meaning in difficulties in trials he served the lord he states that he ministered to people publicly and house to house so you know the nature of paul's ministry it was hard work uh, a lot of courage and uh, uh, you know humility so he points that out to the people and towards the end of his sharing he also uh, talks about how he did not exploit anyone uh, how he did not covet people silver or gold but he worked with his own hands that provided for him his necessities and so this is a paul's way of um, saying that you know i've been sincere in my ministry and uh, you can learn from it so 
it's inspiring and at the same time quite challenging for all of us to serve God the way Paul uh, served God. So he points out you know, his kind, his nature of ministry. Now, apart from this, he also wants the church and he tells them that uh, there will come a time when there will be people who rise among the church and they may bring in you know false teachings they may bring in um, false doctrines they may harm the church uh, but uh, he confidently and encourages exhorts the church and says that uh, they've been taught the word of god and you know he points out something very beautiful uh here in verse 28 he says uh, therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the holy spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of god which he purchased with his own blood so he he is talking about the fact that the church is god's and at the same time, God has chosen the leaders as overseers and their duty is to shepherd the church. Shepherding the church meaning protecting the church against um, uh, uh, any attack of the evil one, uh, nurturing the believers, uh, helping the believers to mature in God. So that uh, was the kind of shepherding that Paul was talking about. And in any case, the people, the elders had already seen how diligently Paul led and how diligently Paul served the people. And so that was an example before them already. So he called them to be true shepherds, good shepherds of the church. So this is how Paul warned them. Uh, and let's also look at verse 32, uh, which gives us uh, you know, some insight uh, where Paul says, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So he's talking about the word of God, which he had already taught the believers. And it was this word of God, which was able to build or strengthen the believer and give the believer an inheritance among the people of God. So he commends the believers to the word of God. So in this way, he exhorted the leaders, he encouraged the leaders, and uh, you know he also shares with them about the fact that uh, very soon he might see danger and he might actually uh, never return. And, and so, you know, he, he talks about how uh, the Holy Spirit was reminding him time and again that there are troubles awaiting him in his onward journey. Uh, and, and so, uh, when he shares uh, all these things, the elders of the church are so moved, and in fact, they are uh, they are deeply hurt uh, by this this reality that if Paul, when Paul goes, that they would never have uh, they will never have an opportunity to meet him once again. And so we also see the warm affection among the brethren. We also see the warm affection that uh, Paul had for the elders and the elders had for Paul that, you know, they uh, they embrace and they kiss. That was their, their expression of, um, you know, uh, showing their warmth and so they did that and they cried uh, in in uh, this situation before they actually bid goodbye to paul so uh, it's really a beautiful picture of the way paul ministered and uh, the the kind of bond that he had with the believers so with this we come to the end of acts chapter 20 and we will continue with the remainder of the missionary journey soon. Um, thank you, everyone, and uh, God bless you.